caller. This is Rodney from Castle, Maine. Hi, Rodney. Hi, Yvonne. Tell us a bit about yourself. What work do you do in Castle, Maine? Uh, I'm a marine biologist. Wow, professional man. Now an important question, your age? Oh, I'll be 35. And for those women who think astrology is important, what's your star sign? Uh, I'll be a Gemini. Any hobbies? Well, uh, I like sport, I like basketball and squash. And what else can you tell us about yourself? Ooh, well, I have no hang-ups. Um, I'm a non-smoker. And what are you looking for in a partner? Uh, well, I'd just like to have a partner, you know, to, you know, to share happiness and a quiet life. Well, there you are, ladies. Sounds like a good catch. If you'd like a date with Rodney, the number to call is... This is the city of Katoomba, in the centre of the scenic Blue Mountains, west of Sydney. It's here that a ruthless killer, Rodney Francis Cameron, alias Rodney Mallard, will begin and end a string of cold-blooded murders. When Cameron comes here in 1973, he's just another minor criminal with convictions involving illegal drugs and petty crime. He gets married and at the age of 21 settles down to start a new life. But it's not long before he loses his nursing job at a private hospital. And then in January 1974, his wife throws him out of their home. Jobless, homeless and with little money, he seeks out a former workmate, 49-year-old nurse, Florence Jackson. Hi, Florence. How are you? Oh, hi, Rodney. What are you up to? Ah, uh, just out for a walk. It's a lovely day. Why don't you come in for a cup of tea? Yeah, I'd love to. It's Saturday, the 31st of January, 1974, when he calls at Jackson's Katoomba home. Uh, he was seen by witnesses talking to her out on the front lawn. He then went inside uh, with Mrs. Jackson, or Miss Jackson, I should say. She was a, uh, a lady, 49 years of age, very frail. She had a, um, a disease that um, made her very thin. Florence offers to pay him if he'll help her with some painting work. Cameron agrees, and a little later, he's up on a ladder painting when she walks past. That looks good. Does it? Here's your cup of tea. I want tea, bitch! He suddenly kicks out. She runs away screaming, but he's quickly upon her and shoves her into a bedroom. Get on the bed, you bitch! Get on the bitch! She fights back as he begins to pull off her clothes, but his hands close quickly on her throat. and choke her until she lies still. <laughs> After raping her, he strangles her again before choking her with a towel. Apparently unable to look at what he's just done to her, he covers the body. Police will soon come to recognise this callous choking and the covering of the face as Cameron's chilling signature. And his explanation was, and it's in his record of interview that he signed, uh, was that he uh, just didn't want to remember their faces after they were dead. Florence had little cash in the house, and so Cameron steals her savings passbook and checkbook, along with a radio and some other valuables. We think he was in the house for about an hour, and we don't know exactly why he took so long 
to leave, but he then went down to um, Lura Railway Station, where he uh, changed out of the, out of the uh, overalls he was wearing, and got rid of some of the property down the toilet. Cameron then embarks on a bizarre petty crime spree, using the savings bank passbook and checkbook to extract cash from various local businesses. At the local post office, he pretends to be Florence Jackson's son and sends a bogus telegram saying she's been injured. It's a very cunning attempt to try to convince staff to let him withdraw cash from Florence Jackson's savings account. Despite his pleas, the staff refuses, and so his next target is a local cafe. He places a large order for party food, paying in advance with a check. The delighted caterer also agrees to cash a check for him. He then wanders into a nearby food market operated by grocer Alvin Clark. I saw him wandering around in a sort of a, oh, a sort of semi day sort of condition. He was looking in the delicatessen window and he, I can't remember exactly what he said, but he said, I want some stuff. But I said, I can only pay with a check. I said, who's oh, check? And he said, well, it's, a check is made out to me, but he said um, it's made out by the lady that I did some work for today. I said, what sort of way? I said, I've been gardening. I said, where at? He said, Katoomba. I said, where? He said, oh, at the hospital or pretty close to the hospital. Anyway, I said, look, <clears throat> I can tell you're doing it tough. If you want a bit of food, get what you want. Take it from the shop. Give me your name. I'll write the amount in the book, and tomorrow when you get your cheque changed, I will accept your money. When asked to provide identification, Cameron gives his correct name and address. It was sort of a, a sign to me uh, that perhaps he was wanting to get caught, that he was trying to tell somebody, uh, because he went to about five shops uh, in the uh, Katoomba and Blackheath area, and by using her checkbook with her name on it, he actually signed his own name and address. Cameron wanders back into the street and goes to a public phone where he begins the setup for his next attack. Our parents have been in a bit of a nasty accident and I was hoping to pick her up and go visit. Here's your cup of tea. I want tea, bitch! 21-year-old Rodney Cameron has strangled nurse Florence Jackson in her home at Katoomba, west of Sydney, in early 1974. His final act is to choke her by stuffing a towel in her mouth and then covering her body. After cashing her cheques at local shops, he goes to a public telephone. Oh, hi, Matron. How are you doing? It's about 6 p.m. when he calls the nursing home where he'd recently worked and asks to speak to a nurse, Craig. Yeah, but the thing is, I don't, I don't have her current address. He uh, was told that the nurse was off duty. He then told the, the matron of the hospital that uh, he was the nurse's brother and uh, that her parents had been involved in an accident in Queensland and that uh, he wanted her address urgently so he could go and help her. And that the girl would be missing for, uh, would be away from her work for two weeks attending to her parents. Yeah, I hope they're all right. The unsuspecting matron gives Cameron Nurse Craig's address and he immediately takes a cab to her home here in the nearby village of Blackheath. He tells her he needs to talk to her about losing his job. However, once inside, he begins to make sexual advances, but he's suddenly interrupted by the arrival of two of her girlfriends. There's no doubt in my mind that he was about to commit another murder uh, because of the way he'd, he'd, he'd got to her address and her absence for a fortnight. 
And um, fortunately, the matron had uh, concerns for her staff and she sent a couple of girls around to see how she was. And that prevented him uh, from going any further. Florence Jackson's body is discovered two days after the murder. Police established she was last seen talking outside her house with a man in a brown jacket. The shopkeepers also confirmed the man who cashed the checks was wearing a brown jacket and he gave his real name. We'd identified his fingerprints. We'd had him identified in the house. And of course, uh, the checks with his name and address on it made him fairly suspicious. Um, we circulated him. It was one of the first occasions we were allowed to um, circulate a person's name and photograph. As the manhunt begins, Cameron is travelling south on the Prince's Highway, hitchhiking towards Melbourne. Six days after Florence Jackson's murder, and somewhere inside Victoria, he's given a lift by an unsuspecting bank clerk, Frank Chiliberto. Where you going to, mate? Mate, anywhere you're going, mate. Anywhere you're going. Job Cheers, eh? Frank is a shy young man, making his first big trip away from home. He was a very um, quiet, unassuming person, but had a great sense of humour and a warm sort of, and friendly in a, re in a way that perhaps is contradictory in that he was reserved with people he didn't know, but within the family, you know, he, he always um, was very warm and he and Peter got on very well. Came up, you know, I'd like to go and do a trip to Sydney, basically, you know, and that was his sort of breaking out. Wanted to drive up to Sydney and, and come back, and that was meant to be about uh, a couple of weeks. It's the morning of Wednesday, the 6th of February, when Frank turns off the highway and drives with Cameron down to the seaside community of Malakuta, about 500 kilometres east of Melbourne. And I do believe that Frank probably knew that area because I think he'd worked in a branch there on relieving duties at somewhere up that way, Monthaggy, or that seems to come to mind. So he maybe was heading towards that area looking to say hi to some people or something. Yeah, it's nice here. It's such a good field. Yeah, we came down. The two are walking on a rocky beach when Cameron suddenly picks up a rock and strikes the young man on the head. Yeah, it's beautiful here. Yeah, it's nice, isn't it? There's a park up here that I can show you. It's really nice. As with his first murder, he strangles his victim before choking him, this time by stuffing a shirt sleeve and a football sock down his throat. Searching through Frank's pockets, he finds his wallet, checkbook and car keys. Once again, he can't bear to look at the face of his victim, so he covers Frank's head with his brown corduroy jacket. The exact time of the murder and Cameron's movements are unknown. It is known that he drove north in Frank's car. Around 10 p.m. that night, the highway patrol sees him cross a double line near Batemans Bay. It's the era when driver's licenses have no picture ID, so Cameron calmly assumes Chiliberto's identity and is issued with a fine. The next day, Thursday the 7th, another highway patrol finds him sleeping in the car beside the Warringah Expressway at North Sydney and orders him to move on. In Victoria, Frank Chiliberto's body is about to be discovered. 
But by then, Cameron is heading towards Queensland and his next attack. This time, however, his intended victim will manage to escape with her life. There's a park up here that I can show you. It's really nice. In early 1974, 21-year-old psychopath Rodney Cameron has murdered two people in New South Wales and Victoria. A fisherman finds the bloodied body of his second victim, Frank Chiliberto, lying on a rocky beach at Malacuta, with clothing still stuffed down his throat and a brown jacket over his face. There's no ID on the body, and the baffled police make a public appeal for help to identify the victim. And we did presume, as it turned out correctly, that he uh, was probably uh, picked up a hitchhiker, and because he had no car there, and they uh, put various facts in the paper, and as a result of those facts, uh, certain matters started to emerge. The jacket, however, is quickly linked to Cameron. Uh, at that stage, we had circulated the rod and that particular jacket. And uh, we had a call from uh, Detective Sergeant Jim Fry from the Melbourne homicide. Fry actually flew up to Katoomba uh, with the jacket and we had it identified. And we then said, OK, well, this, this, this guy is completely out of control. By this time, Cameron has driven Frank's car all the way to far north Queensland, cashing Frank's checks at service stations and shops along the way. He finally abandons the car when it breaks down near Cairns. We were in touch with the police and the detectives in Cairns and found quite a number of checks were there and they had certain exhibits. When they told us about Silla Berta's car, we were all but certain that the person we were looking for was uh, Rodney Cameron. Two weeks after Frank's murder, Queensland police find the car abandoned, trace the registration, and Frank's body is finally identified. Cameron's next move is to go to an isolated farmhouse near the city of Mackay, where he finds a young mother alone with a young child and a baby. Holding a knife to her throat, he tells her, I've already killed two people. He uh, took her into the bedroom and uh, demanded money and then the keys of the car and uh, then took her outside and uh, forced her into her own vehicle and was about to drive away when the, uh, I think the child was about three, came running out to her and she grabbed the child and put the child with her. Now Rod later told us he was going to murder that woman uh, until the inter intervention by the child. Cameron drives about 45 kilometres before the hostages escape near a service station in the town of Serena. He then drives off in the woman's car, but he doesn't get very far. It broke down. Uh, he began to hitchhike uh, when he was picked up by police who had a roadblock waiting for him up ahead anyway. He readily confesses to the murders. He was, uh, he was one of those sort of fellows that was, was quite proud of what he, he did in some respects. He was quite open about them, but he was not quite as um, convincing when it came to asking questions such as uh, about the rape of, the, of Mrs Jackson. You see, at the time of the murder, he strangled her and then uh, had sex with her. Um, and he really didn't want to admit the fact that the scientific evidence would indicate that she was either unconscious or dead at the time. When they caught him, Cameron said the most chilling thing. He said to them, I have to kill three. He'd already killed two, so I presume he's talking about persons. And the three uh, would be a third one. And I have no doubt 
that the lady from uh, just north of Mackay was going to be that victim. Extradited from Queensland, Cameron was charged with the murder of Florence Jackson, sent to trial and found guilty uh, and sentenced to life imprisonment. Released 10 years later, in 1984, he's immediately extradited to Victoria and tried for the murder of Frank Ciliberto. I remember very vividly thinking 10 years wasn't much for a person to serve for a murder. I was quite horrified. Diagnosed as a psychopath not fit to be in society, he was sentenced to in the judge's own words, the term of his natural life. Um, there was a sense of uh, relief and a sense that um, he would be gone for a, uh, a very long time um, and, and, and an expectation that he wouldn't ever be released. If and when he got out of uh, Victoria, he would then be charged by the um, Queensland police for um, for the abduction of the woman and, and, and child up there. So you know, putting all that together to say, well, this person will never be released. At last, Cameron had been locked away forever. So we thought. Three years into his prison sentence, he marries a woman named Anne, whom he'd known years before. Soon afterwards, he launches an appeal against his life sentence. He's just one of many killers in the 1980s who cunningly take advantage of a change to the sentencing laws. The law's reform is meant to keep the worst killers behind bars, but it has an unintended side effect. It allows serving prisoners to argue that if a life term now means whole of life, then their sentences must have been for a lesser time. There's a rush of appeals as many of the country's worst killers, including Cameron, demand a definite release date. Incredibly, the authorities decide Rodney Cameron is fully rehabilitated and order he be released. That's not, that's not justice. And in such a heinous crime, I mean, they would have had the facts before them. Um, the fact that also he had abducted a woman and child and was going to, had told them he was going to kill them. I did, why, why didn't he ever stand trial for that? Why was he released and allowed to walk free? Why, why was there no trial for that, at least? That would have kept him off the, the streets. How, how did that come about? On March 12th, 1990, after serving only six years of his life term, Cameron is released and he settles down with his wife in the outer western suburbs of Melbourne and immediately begins planning his next murder. This time, he'll select his victim after setting an elaborate trap. It's only a few weeks since his release when Cameron starts to put his sinister plan into action. This is an adult he begins program. making calls to a Saturday night talkback show hosted by Yvonne Lawrence. There's a late night Lonely Hearts Club ring-in type of thing that was conducted by 3AW. And uh, that had been a long running program and uh, Cameron had uh, indicated that he listened to it in jail. Now let's go to our next caller. Hi, Yvonne. And uh, when he got out, oh, he, and he was only released for a short time, got onto the program and made a number of calls to 3AW, trying to make contact with women. Oh, I'll be 35. In late May, he calls and tells Lawrence he's seeking a partner to share his happiness oh, and enjoy a quiet, good life. He says he's a non-smoker and non-drinker. His star sign is Gemini, and he works as a marine biologist. 
His hobbies are described as watching basketball and baseball. And he assures listeners he has no hang-ups. Nine lonely women respond to the call. To share happiness and a quiet life. Sounds like a good catch. Cameron's movements in the weeks immediately following the radio show remain a mystery. Years later, he'll make vague claims to police that during that time he murdered two women in Victoria in separate knife attacks. The Blue Mountains district west of Sydney has been a popular tourist destination since the 19th century. The townships that stretch westward along the high ridges are dotted with motels, hotels and resorts, some of them dating back to the 1920s. On Friday, June 22, 1990, less than a month after the Melbourne radio show, Rodney Cameron checks into a resort motel in Katoomba, the very town where he murdered Florence Jackson 16 years earlier. The woman with him this time is 44-year-old Maria Golner, one of the women who responded to his call on the matchmaking radio show. <laughs> Maria Golner was described by friends who knew her as a loving, trusting, good and decent woman who was looking for someone to spend her life with. Cameron sounded like just the ideal man. It's been such a perfect day. Oh, it's so pretty here. Now she's on a romantic holiday with a man she hopes will become her permanent life partner. So far, he's been charming and attentive, and she's looking forward to getting to know him better over the next two days. The couple pays for their accommodation in advance and are allocated a room. At about 1.30 p.m., Cameron had gone to the motel and ordered breakfast for the following morning for two people and made inquiries about when the room would be cleaned. He also asked for a do not disturb sign from the manager. <sighs> that was nice out in the park. Wasn't it just? Yeah, it was lovely. It's now time for a, uh, maybe a bit of privacy, what do you think? Yeah. A splash of red? Yes, please. <laughs> The couple have a few drinks together with Maria completely unaware she's in mortal danger. Oh, this is very decadent in the middle of the day. Well, we're on holidays, you know, so uh, to us. Cheers. Now, happy future together. Mm. Could you just excuse me for a moment? Sure. sure. Suddenly, Cameron launches his attack, bashing her over the head. She collapses on the bed and he continues to bash her in the face. Using one of his neckties, he binds her hands behind her head. Following his usual ritual, his next move is to take hold of her throat. Slowly, he squeezes, watching as she dies in his hands. He leaves his terrible calling card taking a handkerchief and stuffing it in her mouth. He ensures she's completely suffocated by tying a pair of her nylon stockings around her head, blocking both her mouth and her nose. but his cold-blooded murder ritual is not quite complete. Nearby, a bunch of yellow carnations is standing in the basin, 
a touching reminder of Maria's hopes for a romantic weekend. He picks up the flowers and drops them on the bloodied corpse. His last act is to pick up the bath mat and cover her face. He sits down and composes a confession in the form of an apologetic letter to his wife, Anne. It reads, my dearest Anne, had I not done what happened, my life would have been destroyed. Love eternally, Rodney. He then drives away, heading south again. Forty-four-year-old Maria Golner has become the latest victim of serial killer Rodney Cameron after meeting him through a Lonely Hearts radio program. Cameron leaves her lying in a Blue Mountains motel room, her body bearing his terrible trademark, her throat stuffed with a cloth. He's far away by the time the motel maid enters the room late on the following morning. Uh, she is dressed in a red dress, still had her stockings on, but was barefooted. She had severe bruising about her eyes. And when we went to the main area of the, the room, we found a blanket covering the floor. Underneath the blanket was a lot of blood. On the walls was blood spatter. We didn't find any indication of sexual assault. Scientific and Homicide Squad police spent today sifting through the unit looking for clues. Detectives say the body was found in the bathroom and appears to have been bashed. The murder is chillingly similar to the attacks on Florence Jackson and Frank Chiliberto. And once again, Cameron has made no attempt to cover his involvement. Well, certainly Cameron had registered under his own name with the correct address when they attended the motel. Uh, although he was driving a car, his car, he supplied a false number plate, but police found a fishing license in the motel room, which in the name of Rodney Cameron. Once again, a manhunt is launched and a clear description is circulated. A week later, Cameron's wife, Anne, contacts the police station at Deniloquin in the far southwest of New South Wales. She indicated to police that Cameron had been in contact with her, that something had happened at Katoomba, that there was a third person involved, and that he was not going back to jail. Uh, she had further conversation with him and he indicated that he was prepared to give himself up to police. He gave, you know, he gave himself up to us, like late, uh, but, and that all went quite smoothly on the side of the road. We made sure it wasn't anywhere near town because we didn't you know, want anybody around in case, you know, something happened. Um, he was reasonably cooperative. We went to the Newlyquin Police Station. The detectives are struck by Cameron's calm demeanour. Despite giving the appearance of a quiet, polite, softly spoken man, it's clear to them that he has the trademark coldness and lack of emotion seen in this type of serial killer, a complete absence of any compassion. We did the short interview, but then when uh, we went to, we instructed the guys there to take fingerprints from him because we had fingerprints from the uh, evidence from the room. It's then that Cameron suddenly reveals his violent side. He got quite upset because uh, I guess he'd been in jail in Victoria for some time and, uh, and, and you know, he weren't able to just take fingerprints from any person that uh, you'd arrested if they, if they weren't cooperative about it, uh, whereas you could in New South Wales. So he became quite upset when we uh, told him that uh, he was in New South Wales and yes, we were going to take his fingerprints. 
uh, and he made a few threats about the fact he's going to, you know, take a gun off the police and kill us and that sort of thing. But you know, none of it sort of ever went anywhere. Police charge Cameron with the murder and samples of his blood are taken and comparisons made with samples found at the scene. But he then claims that Maria was killed by another man called Frederick Mulner, who was traveling with them. A detailed search, however, fails to find anyone with that name. Numerous inquiries were made. It was found that no person had been seen at the motel. There was no indication of a third person being there. He even gave us a photograph, a very grainy photograph of a of a man on a bed with a lot of tattoos. So we, and they looked like prison tattoos, you know, there's a lot of them. So we sent them through the prison system trying to identify anybody that was, that had those same tats uh, that we never uh, could find anybody like that. I went to the electoral commission and searched the whole of Australian electoral rolls for any name like that and uh, dis discounted any that were similar. Cameron's trial for Maria Golner's murder begins in the New South Wales Supreme Court in October 1992. Hi Florence, how are you? And it makes legal history when the prosecution is permitted to tell the jury about Cameron's other murders. Usually in New South Wales trials, an accused person's previous criminal record is kept secret. Because evidence of other criminal acts is so prejudicial against an accused, that the courts have always said that um, um, it's, it's only in rare cases that such evidence would be admitted as similar fact evidence. Where are you going to, mate? Mate, anywhere you're going. The similar mate. acts had a striking hallmark about them in common with the offence that the accused was charged with. So that basically any reasonable person would say the same person must have done both crimes. The judge rules that the jury should hear the full horrific details of Cameron's previous murders of Florence Jackson and Frank Ciliberto, including the trademark choking cloth left in the throats of the bodies. I then had to find evidence uh, from people that had seen the scenes uh, in 1974 of the two murders and that evidence was accepted in court, which is, from what I was told, that was the first time since about 1890 that evidence of something in a similar, in a, in a very serious offence like that had been presented at court, in a court in New South Wales. The evidence seals his fate and he's convicted. He's sentenced to life and this time never to be released. But Australia has not heard the last of Rodney Cameron. Two years later, he'll be charged with yet another violent murder, the mysterious killing in 1974 of 79-year-old Sarah McKenzie. Sarah McKenzie was a widow who lived alone in a quiet North Sydney street. She came a little bit bigoted. She was uh, cranky with anyone parked outside the, her house. She would uh, go and berate them. If children were playing in the street, she would go cranky on the children playing in the street. About 5 p.m. on Wednesday, February 6th, 1974, the same day that Cameron had murdered Frank Ciliberto in Victoria, a witness saw a man at Sarah's house. At about 5 p.m., a witness was walking past Sarah McKenzie's house and he saw a young male, about 26, five foot eight with blonde hair, walk up the front stairs of a house and to the front door. About 5.10 p.m., another witness was walking by and heard Sarah McKenzie say, it is my house, no one can take it from me. At 5.50 p.m., North Sydney police receive a phone call from someone with a deep voice giving Sarah's name and address and saying a man has come into the house and assaulted her. And there were some unusual things about that call, that the person that logged that call at the police station actually 
wasn't sure that it was a woman's voice. Uh, so there was some suggestion that it may even have been the killer who, who made that call. No description was taken. It, uh, the police officer that, was, that took the call from her stated that there was no, she wasn't upset, she wasn't anxious, uh, and she just said she'd been assaulted and he gained the impression from the way she was talking that it wasn't a bad assault and that she just wanted police down there to investigate it. About an hour later, police arrive at Sarah's house, but they get no answer when they knock on her door. On Friday morning, a concerned neighbour who hasn't seen or heard from Sarah since Wednesday rings the police. They knocked on the door a few times. They had no response. They looked through a skylight on the front door. They saw blood stains all over the hallway. So they gained entry through a side window that was open and found Sarah McKenzie laying on the floor. She was covered with a blanket, her panties over her, and a mattock, a garden mattock embedded in her head with the handle sticking up in the air. From the bloody crime scene, detectives are able to piece together the likely series of events inside Sarah's house. She's attacked from behind with a garden fork. She's badly wounded when he drives home the attack with a large knife. She's moved into the hallway, which gives him more room for the final assault. This time, an even more lethal weapon, a garden mattock. He swings it high and brings it down on her head. He then covers her with a blanket. It was just soaked with blood. I don't think she had any blood left in her body when the post-mortem was conducted. Uh, it was splattered on the walls, it was splattered all over the floor, and then there's large pools of blood on the floor where she'd been lying for some, to certain, some time before she was moved. Sarah's murder baffles police. They speak briefly with Cameron, but the case remains open and it'll be another 18 years before a review of the facts throws up his name again. Seventy-nine-year-old Sarah McKenzie died in 1974 in a violent attack in her North Sydney home. The case is still unsolved in 1992 when a prison inmate comes to police to tell them Rodney Cameron had been boasting in jail about killing McKenzie. Um, we went through a process of investigation and um, through jail informants we were able to capture a number of conversations between a number of people and Rodney Cameron, um, where he made admissions to and detailed um, some information regarding the murder of uh, Mrs McKenzie. He um, told him all about the murder of Mrs uh, McKenzie and where they could find the, the property that he stole from her house and uh, it was actually sold in Serena at the time he abducted the, the woman. Detectives find evidence that around the time Sarah died, a highway patrolman moved Rodney Cameron on after finding him asleep in Frank Chiliberto's car parked on a morning clearway at North Sydney. It was only a short distance from the house where Mackenzie died. They established that Cameron was familiar with the North Sydney area. He admitted to investigating police in 1993 that he'd been living in his car in the North Sydney area for some weeks prior. And we believe it was during that time that he had met Sarah McKenzie. And we found um, at the time that she'd had two cups of, uh, 
it's two cups and saucers out and that um, there was a full pot of tea so you know, potentially she'd invited this person in um, for a cup of tea and to do again some odd job for her. Cameron denies having killed Sarah McKenzie but during a police interview he notices the bag of murder weapons in the corner of the room and makes a telling remark. And you couldn't see in the bag, but he said, you know, is that the Matic and do you have the knife as well? So only the person who was responsible for the murder would know intimate details of the murder weapons and what was used to kill this woman. Once again, Cameron is charged with murder, but this time the evidence is heavily circumstantial and the director of public prosecutions orders that the case be no billed and the charge be dropped. It was a situation where there was a, a, a cogent body of evidence that would have supported a Crown case, but there was also a substantial body of evidence that cut across that and made a Crown case very difficult. And it included evidence that, I think it was on the Friday, the 8th of February 1974, um, that Mr Cameron had arrived in Queensland and booked into a motel. Police say that Cameron from his jail cell continues to play games with them, hinting to them about other murders he'd committed. He then admitted uh, that perhaps he pushed a bloke off the Harbour Bridge. They'd climbed up there uh, as a dare to see who could go closest to the side um, of the edge of one of the platforms and Rod said that uh, this guy was walking closer than he and he said, I think I'm pretty sure, I, I, but I, I pushed him when he went too close. Uh, we went back and checked the books and found a person had in fact fallen to his death from the bridge uh, at the time that Rod said and in records uh, kept at the police station. Uh, about an hour and a half after that person's body was found uh, a report came in to say there was a person climbing underneath the Harbour Bridge and there was no doubt Rod uh, after the person, climbing down after the person had fallen. We went back to speak to him again but uh, he wouldn't admit uh, actually pushing and we had no evidence to, uh, to charge him. Police allege that in 1997 Cameron contacted them saying he wanted to confess to killing Sarah McKenzie. He delayed making the formal confession, saying he needed time to explain the murders to his daughter. But he then changed his mind and gave his confession to a newspaper reporter. Rod sort of played a game with you. He, um, uh, he, he would admit to something that, you, that he knew that you knew about. He, he, you, wouldn't, you couldn't uh, interview him on, on, uh, and ask him to declare it. You would have to say to him what you knew uh, about the murder and then he would then openly admit it. But he used to play games with you. He used to say, uh, you know, uh, you, you know I've done others. Um, you go and do some work and come back and see me. And if you, you know enough about him, I'll tell you whether it was me or not. Trust. I would describe him as being someone who showed the trait of, traits of a serial killer. Um, he was manipulative, um, he was very calm, cunning and almost playful at times with the information that uh, we had and we knew that he had as well. Cameron also allegedly told detectives he bashed in the skull of a man in South Australia in 1974 and also strangled another woman in New South Wales but police say he gave no names and very little detail. While there are still people missing from that time, Cameron's new confessions came after the jailing of mass murderers Ivan Malat and John Wayne Glover. Police say it's possible he invented these other killings so that he could claim to be Australia's worst serial killer. But they also say he could be telling the truth. He knew that I was aware that he was sick and that had done other, other murders. Uh, and to this day, we'll probably never know exactly what, what Rod did. Rodney Francis Cameron is a pure psychopath. 
absolutely no doubt about it. He's the type of person that could walk out of a room in the middle of dinner, murder someone, be back in 10 minutes and sit down and finish his dinner as though absolutely nothing had happened. How he was ever allowed out of jail after serving only 16 years in prison for violently murdering two people must be one of the greatest blunders in the judicial system in the history of Australia.